critical to you, and I want you to write this topic down if you want to take a few notes. I do want to advise you to take notes today for the next few minutes because you will want to remember, especially the young people here today, the important facts and truth about your life and about the life of Jesus. We want to speak on the subject, the birth and death of death. Today we want to understand the reason why Jesus had to die, why he had to die. I think every day somebody dies and every day there's a funeral somewhere. And some of you have experienced the pain of death from a family loved one. But why did he die? There are seven great controversies in history. I want to name the seven greatest controversies. These cause the most problems in the world. I picked up the US News and World Report magazine yesterday. I picked up the Time magazine this week, day before yesterday, in Charlotte, North Carolina, as I was flying through. I picked up a copy of Newsweek. And I found out that on the cover of all the top US magazines that carry news, they had a picture of Jesus. And it seemed as if even though they may hate him and don't want him in the courtroom or don't want him in the schools or they don't want him in the judiciary, don't want him in government, somehow they can't ignore this inanimous figure, this historic problem called Jesus. The skeptics, they hate him. The Gnostics, they say that he wasn't real. He was some apparition. They have the atheists who say he was just a good man, not really anything important. And there are those who say that he died as a martyr for a cause. But this man caused more controversy in the past 2,000 years than any figure in history. He's been dead for 2,000 years and he is still a problem in our university's classrooms today. Why can't we get rid of this man? Why can't we just get him out of our economy, out of our politics, out of our social life? Get rid of Jesus. That seemed to be the desire, but the reality is difficult. The first controversy that has caused problems is the birth of Jesus. They hate Jesus the fact that he was born supernaturally. Secondly, the life of Jesus is a controversy. His miracles, the way he responded to pressure, the way he handled criticism, the way he forgave the unforgivable, the way he dealt with people who deserve no mercy. His life got people and still make them angry. The third controversy is his message. What he preached didn't make any sense. He taught love and not war. He didn't attack the Roman Empire and yet he promised that he would destroy them. His disciples used a sword. He told them to put it up. His message was a message of a kingdom and yet it did not want to take over nations physically. It's a strange message. Then his death was a problem and that's the big one we deal with today. All men have to die and many men were crucified on the, this, in this way but this man's death has caused more problems than his life because after he died the thing that he gave to the earth grew which was his message his kingdom and then the next controversy is his burial they're still wondering where his grave is they're not sure what happened to his body there's all kinds of arguments and all kinds of discussions and debates about this man matter of fact they can't find his body but yet they're still not sure where he is and then the next controversy is his resurrection. Did he rise from the dead or did they steal his body? Did they hide him? 
Has, has anyone seen him? Can a man really rise from the dead after three days of rotting? Is it possible for man to live again after he's been killed and, and commissioned into death and sealed in a tomb? Is it possible? It's a controversy still today. The last controversy is his promise. He promised he's coming back and everybody's wondered if it's true. Some people say it's impossible, so you might as well eat and live and drink and be merry for you might as well have fun today because today you might die, so you might as well have fun. There ain't no coming of Christ. It's a controversy about his promise that he's coming back. These are the greatest controversies in history. But I've come here to talk to you about why he's so controversial. I want to talk about what caused him to come. The reason why he had to come and die. First, I want to introduce to you what I call the curse of death. This is the ultimate result of disobedience. It's the rebellion of man against God that caused death. And God calls it sin. Write the word sin down, please. It's a very confusing word to some people. The word sin, when it refers to Jesus, is usually a singular word. It very rarely says he died for our sins. It usually said in the scripture, he died for our sin. It's a singular word. It's singular in the Greek and Hebrew because he really died for only one sin. And that was the sin of rebellion against the known will of God. The word sin in the Hebrew language is the word rebellion. The word sin in the New Testament Greek is not only rebellion but it also means to miss the mark this is what man did God pronounced the wages or the curse of death upon man let's read where death came from and the Lord God commanded the man Genesis chapter 2 verse 16 and 18 you may want to underline this in your Bible. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man these words, quote, You are free to eat from every tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day when you eat from this tree, you will surely die. Everybody say die. Say it loud. This is the first time in the Bible the word shows up. It's introduced not by Satan, but by God. And this word is an invention of God. God created death. Say that with me. God created death. Say it loud. God created death. I thought death was created by Satan, but that is not so. In this chapter, there is no Satan. There is no devil, no demons, no darkness. But in this chapter, there's God. And God is talking to who? Man. And God says to man, the day you eat, you will surely die. Die is introduced by God. So death is something God created. And he introduces it to Adam. However, when God introduced death to Adam, there are a couple of things about death that's a problem. God created death, told Adam about it, and then he told Adam, death has no power. This is Adam, this is the tree, and this is death. And God says, Adam, as long as you don't touch that tree, death can't kill you. But if you eat from that tree, if you disobey my commandments, my word, if you break my word, then that thing that I made that has no power will suddenly come alive and it'll kill you. In other words, death existed before it killed. Can you write that down, please? Death had no power to kill. Death was present, but it couldn't kill Adam as long as Adam did not disobey God. What an awesome formula. God created death without power. And the only way death could get 
power to kill was from Adam who would disobey God. So as long as Adam obeyed God, death was helpless, hopeless, powerless, and dead. I would like to say that death was created dead. Can you write that down? Death was created dead. It had no life. It couldn't kill the man. And yet it was there, but it had no what? Power. Everybody say power. Everybody say life. Death had no power and no life. In other words, death is good when it ain't got no power. Oh, I'm going to say it again. God created everything. And when God was finished, including death, God says, this is good. What's so good about death when it ain't got no power? What's so good about death? It can't kill you. The most horrific nightmare death could ever have is to be able to kill. Death was created not to kill. And that's when it's in its good state. Death, when it is given power, is abnormal. Let's get a little deep. I, I, I'm, Forgive me, Lord. I'm too over the heads. Death cannot kill without permission. And when death kills, it is abnormal. Death in its normal state has no power to kill. Let us talk about what death is. Adam did disobey God. And God pronounced a curse upon Adam. What was the curse upon Adam? It was the curse that God told him. The day you eat from this tree, you will what? Say it loud. Say it on a good Friday. The day you eat from this tree, he says, you will surely die. In other words, Adam, I swear you will die. Surely means I will make sure. Now, I want you to understand that this word surely is God's taking responsibility to make sure that debt does its job if Adam sinned. In other words, if you break my law, Adam, I have to personally make sure that you die. What is debt? I want you to define it. I, mean, I think we need to know what death is. Death is a trifold experience. There are three parts to death. It's good to write them down. Number one, death is the departure of the Holy Spirit from the spirit of man. That's one level of death. It's the most dangerous level of death. Number two, death is the departure of man from the presence of God. Number three, death is the departure of man's spirit from his physical body. So we have three aspects called death. Death is when the Holy Spirit left man's spirit. Death is when man is driven from the presence of God. And death is when man eventually leaves his body because his body is rotting under the stain of sin. Can I suggest to you, according to the word of God, that the first level of death is the one God is really concerned about, but death is progressive. First, when Adam sinned, the Bible says, the day you eat, you will surely die. Everybody say the day. Say it again. He says, the day you eat, you will surely die. That means the day Adam and Eve that fruit and break God's word according to God they died the very day that means then that if Adam lived according to the Bible 930 years after he picked the fruit then according to God physical dying is not real death the day Adam ate he died but he lived physically 
930 years, according to the Bible, a record of his life. In other words, Adam was a dead living man. What does God mean? That means the moment Adam sinned, broke God's word, rebelled against God, missed the mark, the Holy Spirit left Adam's spirit and Adam became dead to God. A man without the Holy Spirit is a dead man. He has a three-piece suit. She's wearing a Georgie dress. He got all kind of Calvin Klein clothes, but he's dead. A well-dressed dead man. The athlete that wins the Olympic gold medal without the Holy Ghost is a dead athlete to God. The beauty queen of the contest is a dead queen to God with a crown. In other words, it doesn't matter what you accomplish. It doesn't matter what you achieve. If you don't have the Holy Spirit inside of your life, you are a successful dead. Adam was dead the day he died before God when the Holy Spirit left. And yet he lived 930 years. And the Bible says he had children. Dead people do have children. The only problem is, the Bible says in chapter 5, he produced after his own kind, which means dead people produce dead people who produce dead people who produce dead people. Your newborn baby is dead to God. The ultimate aspect of death then is the departure of the Holy Spirit of God, for this is the eternal death. When the Holy Spirit left, death was made alive. Now, uh, let me say some things about how death was born. Death was never God's will for mankind. Don't ever think that God created man to kill him. God told Adam, death is present, but it has no power. So death to Adam was a choice. God did not kill Adam. Death killed him. Death did not choose to kill Adam. Adam chose to be killed by death. God told Adam, death is present, has no power, it's up to you. If you disobey my word, the death that has no power will suddenly be given life and death will kill you with the life it got from your disobedience. Therefore, death was given birth when Adam disobeyed God. Death was created by God and it had no life at all. Death was given power by the disobedience of man. And therefore, the most important point I want you to remember is that death was created by God without life. I'm so excited about what I understand. I wept this morning, probably more than all of you, because of this teaching that I understand. I understood when the Son of God walked up with three keys this morning. Some of you got excited about the songs you remember. But to me, I understood what the Father God, with that crown on, was saying to his Son. I have put death back to sleep. One of the greatest mysteries is the life that death has. Let's talk about it real quick. Man's sin gave life and power to death. Let's read what the Bible says here in Romans 5. Please write this down and then read it with me. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered into the world, death by sin was passed upon all men. It's a very powerful statement, and I want to, I want to re-emphasize this to you. It says in verse 13, For before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, 
who was a pattern of the one to come. Now I'm going to read verse 12, Romans 5 verse 12. Underline it please. It says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man's disobedience, and death came through that sin, and in this way, death came to all men, because all men, what? Sinned. Very interesting statement here. Now, I want you to note something in this verse. And I hope I can get this up there. Uh, they got me switched off. Can I have that on for a moment, please? I want to, they got to switch that. I want to, to show you a statement here in this verse. Look at your Bible for a minute. What does it say? bore debt. What does it say bore debt? Do you see it? It didn't say man bore debt, did it? It says man sinned. But it says debt came through what? Debt came through what? Sin. Don't read the Bible too fast. It's very correct. The Bible is meticulously correct. The Bible says debt came through sin. In other words, Death did not come through the man, it came through the act of the man. Oh, help me, Lord. Please write this down. Death is a product of sin. What is sin? Rebellion against God. In other words, death got its life when man disobeyed God. So in order for God to get rid of death, all he got to do is get rid, not of man, but of sin. Do you see the difference? The man did not cause death. Sin caused death. But the man caused sin. So in order for God to solve death, he has to solve sin. And if God can solve sin, then he can solve death. And that is why man had to die. Let me give you some reasons why we had to die. Number one, very important reasons, because God is holy. Number two, because God is faithful. Number three, because God must keep his word. Number four, because God cannot lie. Number five, because God must fulfill his promise. And number six, because God cannot ignore his word. These are the reasons why man had to die. First, let me deal with the first one for a second. Man had to die because God is holy. The word holy means pure in motive. It also means integrated or to be one with yourself. Holy means what you say and what you do are one. Holy means that you are not schizophrenic. Holy means that you don't say one thing and do another. Holy means whatever you say, you do. Whatever you do is what you said. They are one. Holy, therefore, means to be integrated or to have integrity. God cannot say one thing and then change his mind. This is very important. So when God told Adam, the day you eat, you will surely die. When God said that, God had to make sure it happened. Because what he says and what he does is the same. Secondly, God had to make sure man died because he's faithful. God is faithful to himself. Hebrews chapter 8 says, Even if you fail me, says the Lord, I must be faithful still, for I cannot fail myself. In other words, God has to be faithful to what he says. God made sure we died to make sure that he doesn't lie. And that leads to the next one. Because God cannot lie, he has to kill man. Lord have mercy. Or make sure death does. God says, Adam, I told you, you will die. If you disobey me, you will disobey me. Now I cannot lie. I must make sure you die. That's why God couldn't stop Adam from dying. Because God had to be faithful to himself. The killing of man was the faithfulness of God in action. Here's a strange statement. God had to make sure man died because he had to keep his own promise. You know, we like the promises of God, right? He promised to bless me, promised to save me, promised to be, prosper me, but he also promised to kill you. God said, Adam, I make you a promise. You pick this fruit, you dead. That's a promise just like any other promise. So when Adam failed and sinned, God says, I'm going to fulfill my promise. 
kill him dead, and dead carried out the job. Holy Spirit left. Man's body was ripped apart. Man died physically, and he died from the presence of God. He was kicked out of the garden. God says, see, I told you, man, I'm being faithful. I'm fulfilling my promise. You're dead. But this is so critical. I want to read a scripture because God cannot ignore his word. That's why I'm going to die. In the book of Psalm 138, please write this down and read it somewhere. This is one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. It says, I will bow down towards your holy temple, O Lord, and I will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness and for you who have exalted your word above your name. Hallelujah. You have exalted your word above everything, including yourself. All right, buddy. Everybody look at me a moment. I got to explain this. This is, this is really why we got problems right now in the 21st century. Because of this verse. God says, I have placed my word above my name. The Hebrew word for name is the same word as being. That's why in Hebrew, when you name something, it is the thing you name it. <laughs> so when I, um, Moses called God and says, can you tell me what your name is? God's answer had to be, I am my name. Because in Hebrew, name means to be. <laughs> in other words, the thing is its name. So when God says, I have placed my word above my name, he's literally saying, I've placed my word above myself. In other words, when I speak, I too have to be under my own word and do it. God will never speak a word that he himself must not obey. He placed his word above his name. That's why I'm going to make a statement. You can write me a letter if you're watching this on TBN and, and Cornerstone and all the networks we're on. You can write me a letter. We'll argue about it later. But I'll make a statement. Here it is. God is sovereign until he speaks. Only the wise will understand that. We say God is sovereign. That's true. As long as he doesn't talk. Hmm. You ain't going to get it. As soon as God speaks, he ceases being sovereign to that word. Because that word then becomes his regulator. That's why God says, I will move heaven and earth if I have to before one letter of my word doesn't come to pass. He says, my word is established for how long? Forever. That means that when God told Adam, the day you eat, you will surely die, God was setting up a system of authority which says if you disobey me you give life to death and because I cannot break my word death will have to kill you Adam and all of your descendants that you're carrying we read it just now in the book of Romans chapter 5 it says through one man's sin death came into the world and death was passed upon all he was carrying in his loins. All of us came out of Adam's loins. And when Adam sinned, it gave power to death. And death came upon Adam and all he was carrying. And that's why the graveyards are filled with dead people. And that's why you have to die physically. And that's why you will have to go to the grave. Because God has to keep his word. Oh, but I'm excited about today. Everybody say something had to die. Say it loud. Hit somebody and tell them something had to die. Come on, hit them again. Say something had to die. Hit them and say happy Easter. Something had to die. Tell your neighbor Good Friday was necessary. Why was it necessary? Because God cannot lie. Something, oh Jesus, something had to die. God had to kill something to keep his word. 
Because God's word is above his own name. Why? Because death was necessary because of God's word. Death was the natural result and the fulfillment of God's promise. Death could only be justified by death. I'm going to shout by myself here now. You got to hang with me for a few more minutes because this point is important. Death can only be justified by death. In our production a moment ago, some of you missed that statement. I heard it. It pumped out at me. I said, there it is. When the son and the father were talking in the secret meeting, the father says, you will justify them. Everybody say justify. justify. Let me tell you something, friends. Justify. A judge hands out judgment. Judgment is giving something what it rightfully deserves. I'm talking to you. When you go to the courtroom, the judge in that black robe sitting behind that bench is there for one reason. He's there to study your rights. He's supposed to know them. And he needs to know whether you deserve them based on the law. And no matter what the lawyers do, if the judge in the end believes that your rights are being violated, the lawyers don't count no more. The judge can let you go free once you got your rights. Now, when God told Adam, the day you eat, you will surely die, who was God given rights to? Thank you. He was given rights to death. He was telling death, you got a right to kill him if he disobeys me. In other words, death can judge. That's why every sinner, death can kill. Because sin gives death the right to kill. That's why the only way, friend, listen to me, people, I beg you, the only way to avoid death is to get rid of sin in your life. I think the question then of the other religions that you have heard about, Buddhism, Islam, all kinds of Confucianism, Hinduism, Scientology, all the other groups, everybody got a good religion. But the question is, what do they do with sin? A good book of philosophy and values and morals does not get rid of sin. According, you know, I was thinking, I have some some associations who are Muslims, and most of them are now believers, <laughs> but before they got converted, I was intrigued to find out, when I read the Quran, I got a copy in my office, when I read the Quran, I was deeply impressed that the Quran, half of the Quran is the Old Testament. Did you all know that? Yeah. I said, did you know that? Yeah. No, you don't know that. Okay, so the Muslims, keep the TV on, Islam, the Muslims have the Quran, the Bible, their Bible. Half of it is the Old Testament. In it, they got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel. They got them all in their Bible. Now, the problem is, in the book of Leviticus, in their Bible, it says, in verse 21, without the shedding of blood. In their Quran. There's no remission of sin. I respect Muhammad. The guy accomplished a lot. He's done a great job in spreading his philosophy around the world and influenced millions. I appreciate a man who of that kind of leadership and charisma to sway the world and his generation to the point where they are influencing even the world after his death. I appreciate Muhammad. He's a great man. Only problem is there's no blood in this thing. The Mormon church. Yes. The Mormons believe that Jesus was a prophet. One of the sons of God. 
They also believe, keep the TV on please, that Lucifer was also one of God's sons and that Lucifer and Jesus were brothers. This is in the Mormon scriptures. What do they do with blood if he's not the son of God? If he's not redeemer? How do you get rid of death? Death is only justified by death. You can only satisfy death by death. <laughs> My Lord. On the stage this morning, oh, I felt like screaming, but I was weeping too much. Thank you, Sister Kayla. On the stage this morning was a man in chains going to the electric chair. Why? The judge gave him the justice based on the law. The judge said, based on the law, the state has a right to kill you. <laughs> so we led him to the electric chair. He sat in it and he did not repent. He didn't recant. And death was about to justify itself. But somebody walked up. Talk to me. Now the person who walked up could not tell the state, don't kill anybody. Okay. See, mercy is not ignoring justice. Oh, you got to get this. God don't wink at your sin. Somebody can pay for it. Christ couldn't tell the judge, have mercy upon him. Let him go free. Mm -mm. He rightfully deserved death. It was a right of the state to kill him. And so <laughs> the man who walked in that chamber had to say, put me in his place. Because death must be fulfilled. Good Friday is not an option. It's a necessity. This is not something that we're supposed to take lightly. Every person in the world, atheist, pagan, heathen, unbeliever, are supposed to stop for a moment and say to themselves, my God, somebody got to do something about me. I got good news. Somebody did. If you notice, God promised Satan in the same chapter. He promised him a death that would solve the problem. You want to hear the words? It's found in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And the Lord God said unto Satan. Boy, I like God. You know, he's always on time. He says, the woman shall have a seed. And this seed shall be with enmity between you and him. Genesis 3.15, watch this. And he will crush your head. How? When you bruise his heel. Okay. Everybody say heel. Everybody say head. Okay. The word heel in the Hebrew is an idiom. It has to do with the cord of life. You know, when a baby was born in the Old Testament and the doctor took the baby, or I guess no, they had midwives, not doctors. When the baby came, the way they held the baby is by their heel. They pulled the baby <laughs> out and then they would hold it by the heel and based on how the baby responded, they would say, we got life. In other words, the heel was the sign of life. If the heel did not bring a reaction, it was a sign the baby was dead. If I was to cut your heel tendon, you couldn't walk. This piece of flesh behind your heel is so powerful, if I was to slice it, 
You would lose all ability to walk. It holds up your life. God says, Satan, he will crush your head. Head represents authority. But you will bruise his heel. That represents life. In other words, when you bruise him, he going to crush you. Oh, you ain't got the message. When he put his heel on you, when he put his debt down, his debt will destroy your power. Let me show you something that is very interesting about power. Romans 6, 8 says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was, was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. Please notice the word sin is singular. But the life he lives, he lives to God. The death he died, he died unto sin. But the life he lives, he lives unto God. Hebrews 2, I love it. Verse 8, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels, now he is crowned with glory and honor. Why? Because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for every one of you. In other words, somebody got to die, something have to die, God got to kill something. Oh, hallelujah. It says, and he decided to taste it, to experience it for everyone underline the words that he might taste death for everyone that means 6.2 billion people on earth today and not a one of them have to go to hell because he's already tasted death for the buddhist for the anglican for the baptist for the pentecostal for the charismatic he tasted death for the white and the black and the yellow and the old and the young he tasted death for the for the islam and and the hindu he takes death for everybody. Everybody has already been paid for. Going to hell then is a stupid choice. Can I take you a step further? The sting of death. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56, we find these words. The sting of death is what? Sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, God's solution to death is found in the same chapter where the problem of death was born. His solution was the promise of a seed that would destroy the power of death. What is the power of death? That's the question. Well, according to the word of God, the power of death is sin. And the source of sin is rebellion which is found in the heart of Satan. The Bible says Christ came to destroy him who had the power of death. Who had it? The rebellion one. He gave man the spirit of rebellion as well. And man also obtained the power of death. And therefore man became a victim of death because of the sin that he committed of rebellion against God. Let me give you seven reasons why Jesus had to die. Number one, substitution. He had to die because something had to die. Number two, the flesh. Some of you may wonder, why did God have to become a man in order for him to save man? Well, this second one is important. <laughs> the third one, he had to die because God needed blood. Because spirit has no blood. I want to explain this for two seconds. Everybody say death. Say it again. Now the problem with being a spirit is that you cannot die. Man doesn't have a spirit. He is a spirit. So man really never dies. That is why if you die without knowing Christ, you still live forever. The only problem is the Bible calls it eternal death. Because you're a spirit. 
If you die in Christ, you are raised by him and you live forever, but it is called eternal life. I don't want you to think, and listen carefully if you're here this morning, because it's Easter. Listen, I don't want you to think for once that <laughs> when you die without Jesus, without Christ in your life, that you go to the grave, no problem, and then the judgment day comes, no problem, and you stand before God, no problem, and God judges you, no problem, and then God sends you into eternal, into suffering, no problem. I don't want you to think that you're going to burn up. That's the problem. You ain't going to burn up because you are a spirit. Jesus said that when you are cast into hell, he says, the fire never quenches and the worm dieth not and there's gnashing of teeth forever. How would you like to burn and can burn? Eternal death. <laughs> so you can't die Oh, listen to me. You can't die as a spirit. But God needed death. What are the three kinds of death? You remember them? What? Holy Spirit leaving you. What else? You leaving the presence of God. What else? And your spirit leaving your body. Now, stay with me for a few moments. Watch this. Ha! Ha! God says, okay, Satan, in order for me to solve this problem, I have to get out of the spirit world because I can't die. So I got to come into the woman. She's going to provide a body for me through a seed. I'll become a candidate for death. And I'm going to die three ways. Listen, how did he die? Well, first... <laughs> oh, Good Friday. It's a Good Friday. I'm so excited about Good Friday. On Good Friday, Christ on the cross. <laughs> the day before they arrested him, that night, he was praying. And he said, Father, is there any other way to do this? Let this cup the word cup means price. Redemptive price. Pass from me. Let's do it another way. But the father never answered. Why? Because you can't avoid death if you're going to pay death. So he says, not my will, but thine be done. He went to the cross. Watch this. They put nails in his wrists, nails in his ankles. And they stripped him, whipped him. And he's hanging on the cross. Now, in order to be a substitute, he has to experience the exact death that you experience. So first, he has to die by the Holy Spirit leaving him. He must die by being from the presence of God. And he must die by his spirit leaving his body. Let's see if he did it. On the cross, Jesus begins to talk, and he talks his way through each death. You missed it. First, he said, Father, why have you forsaken? Now, you see, for one brief moment, God left God. Oh. He had never felt what it felt like. To be away from father. He felt, he tasted. Everybody say taste. See, he couldn't live there. That was too much for him. So he just tasted it. For three days. He says, father, where are you? This is terrible. Ah! The Bible says he, he screamed out. You don't understand. When you are out of Eden, you malfunction. When you are out of God's presence, 
You go crazy. You kill your mother, shoot your children, rape your mama. You do dumb things. That's why we got crime. Crime is man out of God's presence. And Christ tasted it for one moment. And then the Bible says he cried out. I thirst. And they tried to give him a mixture that they, was, that they used to kill pain. The Bible says he refused it. In other words, they tried to give him a painkiller made of hyssop and some drinks that they used to use to kill pain. It was a painkiller, but he refused it. Why? Because he had to carry a pain. Oh, come on, somebody. That's why if you're sick and hurting today, you can take this message and say, God, this pain is not legal. The pain you feel in your body has no rights. Because Jesus took the rights of that pain away by taking the pain for you. Lift your hands and thank God. You could be healed today because he took away your pain. If he had taken that painkiller, you would have had a right to keep your pain. And then the Bible says, he gave up the ghost. Wow. Which means what? He gave up the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Death means to lose the Holy Ghost. My God. Then the Bible says, and he bowed his head and died. Okay, listen. You missed it. You didn't read it carefully. No, you didn't. Listen. First, you forsake me. Presence gone. Secondly, gave up the ghost. Ghost gone. But he's still there. Then it says, he bowed his head. Now he's leaving the body. He died completely. Not for himself. And that's why you have to give your life to Jesus. This ain't no game for you to play around with. He substituted himself. Paid debt. It's due. And that's why the blood is important. Because the body had blood. Spirit saying God no blood. So he had to become a man with blood. Because without the blood there's no remission of sin. And life and death is in the blood. Say it with me. Life and death is in where? The blood the Bible says. So <laughs> if you want death it's in the blood. If you want life it's in the blood. Spirits have no blood. So Christ had to have Jesus to supply the blood. That's why we worship Jesus, you know that. We don't worship Jesus to try to make him a God. He is God. He's the body of God. Hallelujah. He is the vessel in which God lived to carry out the blood sacrifice. That's why Jesus said, this cup is the blood of my covenant with you. Drink it. Spirits have no blood. But he came to provide it through Jesus. Fourthly, he died because sin had to be paid for. He died because he had to be made sin only by having sin trust upon him. Sin could initiate death. So Christ needed sin. Where did he get his sin from? <laughs> Thirdly, he had to die because he must be resurrected. You can't resurrect, resurrect living things. You only resurrect dead things. And the sixth reason he had to die was to justify us. That means he had to satisfy the demands of righteousness. And then seventh, he had to die to destroy the power of death, to put death back to sleep, to tell death you got no more right to be alive. Death dies when it kills. Say that with me. Death dies when it kills. Say it again. Death dies. Do you know I went to my mother's funeral. I'm standing there looking at my mother's body. And I said, for one brief moment to myself, thank God. 
she's dead. Because I remember visiting my mother a few days before she died, and, and she was in the bed in pain, and I couldn't do anything to help her. I was praying, believing God, but she was in pain. And I said, oh God, deliver my mama from this pain. That was my prayer. And the words of all Roberts came back to me, I'll never forget. He said, the ultimate healing is death. Because when you get healed by death, you can't get sick no more. Let me tell you something. Death is a blessing. Beautiful in the eyes of the Lord is the death of a saint. Why? Because death ain't got no power. Hallelujah. When death kills, it loses its power. Once death kills something, it can't kill it no more. Oh, help me now. So if God can just get death to kill something, death can't kill no more. Ah. Do you understand? So God says, death, if I get you to kill me, you can't kill them. Y'all ain't get the message yet. He said, look, you, you got to kill something, death. I know because that's my word. I gave you that power. But if you kill me, now you got to kill something. Oh, hallelujah. Death. <sighs> Your job is killing. So once you kill something, you got no more power. And that's why death has death. Hebrews 2.14 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, so that by his death, so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and thereby freeing us who all our lives were held in slavery by our fear of death. Wow. Do you know why we're afraid to die? Because we're afraid we ain't never coming back. Come on, you all talk to me before I close now. He said, but there's a guy named Jesus who took on our humanity, shared flesh and blood, and by his death, he destroyed the power that death had. Watch this. So that he may free you and I who all our lives were afraid, scared of death. Let me tell you something, friends. I'm not afraid of death anymore. I am not afraid of death anymore. I will see you again. Guaranteed 100%. Audaciously, emphatically, proudly, without hesitation, I will see thee again. Why? Because death has no right to keep me in the grave. Oh, come on, praise the Lord, somebody. That's why you should live every day with passion, without fear, pursuing God's will for your life. And I mean live hard. Do things good with excellence. Work with all your might. Do it with all your might. Work hard. Why? Don't worry about death. Whether you live or you die, you win. <sighs> because of who? Jesus. He paid the price. He made death powerless. Let me tell you something, friends. At the last home going here, I preached a message and people ain't quite get it. Sometimes, you know, I just say, God, you give me too much. And I was telling them, you know, 
death is ashamed of itself. Because death cannot kill you. You, Lazarus is dead. That was the message. Christ says, he's asleep. Now some of y'all think he was joking. Okay. I was taught in Sunday school, growing up in the church, that that meant that Jesus had planned to raise him. But when I studied as an adult, with the knowledge and the skills of grammar and Greek and Aramaic, when you read the passage, the words he used in his mind, the words he used meant that he didn't plan to raise Lazarus. He was telling them the truth. The guy is asleep. Why? Because death can't kill him. De because, oh he said, because I am in the earth. Hallelujah. Anybody who dies now, death put him to sleep. Why? Because you believe in me, Mary. Now, if you believe that I am the Christ, the Son of God, then your brother shall live again, he says. If you believe. Watch this. He still didn't want to raise him. She said, I believe he will come back. In the last day, Christ says, Christ says, no, you don't understand. No matter what day it is, I am the resurrection. I am carrying about in my body everything required to bring you back. I am the death that Lazarus died. Only problem is I come to whip death. So Lazarus could come back. Now to show you that I could get him now or later, let's go get him now. Oh, come on, somebody. See, Sister Chara, you here today. You know, our beloved brother, Emmy, he, he, he's sleeping. Don't panic. And Jesus says, woman, if you believe, you shall see your husband again. Now, he said, I can do it now or later. Now, for my mother, he decided later. Maybe for your husband, your brother, your cousin, your mom or daddy. He said later. But guess what? Later is sure. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, shout praise the Lord for his death. His death took away the power. Watch this. Therefore... In order, verse 15, to destroy death, God must deal with sin. That's the seed of Christ coming to the world as a man. Made this possible. Dying was not only necessary, but mandatory. Why? Because God cannot lie. He must keep his word. The question then is, who killed Jesus? And I want to answer this question very clearly. Was it the Romans? Was it the Jews? Was it the soldiers or the Gentiles? The Isaiah 53 says in verse 4, Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him who was stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. Who killed Jesus? Read it. God did. Everybody say God killed himself. Say it again. It says God killed Jesus. You know when John saw him coming down the beach, and John was preaching. John stopped preaching. And John saw his cousin, Jesus. And John says, look. The word look is the word behold in Old English. He says, look. The Lamb of God. Now why did he say that? Because in those days, all through the Old Testament, everybody had their lamb. They had to bring their lamb for their sins. But he says, God has provided himself. Now you all talk to me. No more lambs for your children, your cousin, your uncle, your mama. He said, no more lambs. God himself is bringing his own lamb to die for the sins of the world. Therefore, this lamb shall die once and for all. 
It says he was bruised, pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed or bruised for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Everybody say, I'm healed. Lift your hands and claim it right now. You got any problems with you? Tell him I claim that in Jesus' name. Oh, come on, talk to your body. Question, what killed Jesus? Was it the whip, the nails, the crown, or the spear? The answer, Isaiah 53 verse 6. For we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one turned to his own way. And the Lord, and the Lord, and the Lord, and the Lord has laid on him. What? The sins of us all. Who laid them on him? The Lord. What killed him? The wages of sin is death. Who put it on him? The Lord. Capital L. God himself put the sins of man on his son and he died. The spear didn't kill him. The nails didn't kill him. Nails can't kill. Sin kills. And the Lord killed him. What was his goal in his death? Was it a martyr or a good prophet? Isaiah answers verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. Whose will? The Lord's will to crush him. To suffer and to cause him to suffer. The Lord's will for him to suffer. And through, and though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, who made life a guilt offering? The Lord. Read the Bible carefully. It wasn't Pilate. It wasn't Caiaphas. It was the Lord. God was solving death. The Lord made him an uh, offering for us. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands after God kills him. God killed him for you. Isaiah 53, what's the purpose of his death? It says in verse 11, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. That means the resurrection. And he will be satisfied. I like that word. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. He will, be divide, he will divide the spoils, oh Jesus, with the strong. Do you understand that? It says when he goes to death, dies, he will see the light of day. He's going to come back to life. And when he comes back to life, it says that he will divide the spoils. With who? The strong. Guess who they are? His brethren. That's you and me. He gives us what he got. <laughs> Some of the spoils he got, we saw them this morning. There were three keys. Who did he share them with? The strong. His sons, his brethren. He gave you the key of death, hell and the grave. That means, the word key means authority over something. You got authority over hell because you got authority over sin through his death. You got authority over the grave because you can't stay in the grave if you have him inside of your life. You got authority over death because death cannot keep you in the grave because you got the key through his death and his resurrection. And therefore, he shared his spoils with us that he gained through his death because he poured his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. The crisis of Calvary then is simple. And that is the death of Jesus was not a suicide. It was not a martyrdom or a political rebel cause. But rather, Isaiah 53 was very clear. It says, for he bore the sins of, the sin, sorry, of many and made intercession for the transgressors. What a statement. These statements are important in our contemporary society because people are believing that Christ died as a martyr. Look at Isaiah. God says, this man didn't die as no martyr. He didn't die as no good cause rebel. He died to bear the sin of many and he became intercession for the transgressors his death was for you and for me he died so we wouldn't have to die in sin and that's why if we live we live in victory over death i close with this passion first corinthians 15 verse 20 says but christ has indeed been raised from the dead He's the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through man, 
the resurrection of the dead also came through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ is the first sample, fruit, and then when he comes, those who belong to him will come also. Verse 26, everybody say it together. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. That doesn't mean he is going to destroy death. It means the last enemy that you will whip is when you're on your deathbed. Man, I, uh, I stopped. He said, look, I gave you the authority to cancer in your body, your body all mess up. God said, get him, get him, get him, get him. Let him kill you. You get him. Whap! When he kill you, you bust out laughing and say, ha ha! I'm coming back. The last enemy. Oh, hallelujah. Pastor Rich, you know what last means? You suppose, no. Last means you're supposed to beat all the others before you get to him. I got him home right now. Hang on. That means poverty. God say, whip that one. Whap. Depression, whip that one. Whap. Being broke, whip that one. Whap. No house, whip that one. Whap. No car, all these enemies. Bram. He said, whip them all. And the last one I want you to whip. Y'all ain't get it. Ain't get it. Ain't get it. You supposed to beat every enemy. Your mortgage payment don't want to get paid. That's the enemy. God said, whip it. Whap. I gonna pay it. Come on, man. You ain't supposed to die owing everybody. <laughs> You're supposed to die all bills paid. One more enemy left. Whap. You still ain't got it, eh? <laughs> Your business doing one work. God said, whip it. Whap. It wake in. Yeah, it wake in. Good. God said, come on. And to the enemy, when death comes, you whip him. That's the last one. Whap. Now y'all ain't shouting yet, because I ain't going to tell you shout. <laughs> you see, all the enemies you got supposed to be whipped. Tell your neighbor, whatever you're going through, whip it. No, you ain't doing it right. Say, whip it. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor on the other side, whatever you're facing, lick it and whip it. Praise God. Give the Lord a hand. He wants you to whip every enemy. Every enemy shall be whipped. We're going to pick up here tonight with a fantastic movie that I picked myself. You saw some pieces of it. And they're going to roll a little bit of that right now to show you what death looks like. Tell your neighbor, if he died, I don't have to die. Give him a praise offering. I tell you what. He died, he paid the price. Say with me, something had to die, and he did. And because he died, I can live also. Because I am free from the curse of death. Stand up on your feet and scream. Hey, it's Good Friday. Go ahead and shout. Triumphant in my hand. Come on, praise his name. Laugh. Lift your hands and thank him that he jumped in the way and he took the Where blow for you. you. He sat in the chair for you. He gave his life Go for you. Ahead. Lift your hands and begin to thank him right where you are. Everybody, young and old, children, young people. Hallelujah. Worship him right where you are. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You Hallelujah. Go ahead, Charlie. Let's bless the Lord. Because I love.
critical to you and I want you to write this topic down if you want to take a few notes I do want to advise you to take notes today for the next few minutes because you will want to remember especially the young people here today the important facts and truth about your life and about the life of Jesus we want to speak on the subject the birth and death of death today we want to understand the reason why Jesus had to die why he had to die I think every day somebody dies and every day there's a funeral somewhere and some of you have experienced the pain of death from a family loved one but why did he die there are seven great controversies in history I want to name the seven greatest controversies these cause the most problems in the world I picked up the US News and World Report magazine yesterday I picked up the Time magazine this week day before yesterday in Charlotte North Carolina as I was flying through I picked up a copy of Newsweek and I found out that on the cover of all the top US magazines that carry news they had a picture of Jesus and it seemed as if even though they may hate him and don't want him in the courtroom or don't want him in the schools or they don't want him in the judiciary don't want him in government somehow they can't ignore this in inanimous figure this historic problem called Jesus the skeptics they hate him the Gnostics they say that he wasn't real he was some apparition they have the atheists who say he was just a good man not really anything important there are those who say that he died as a martyr for a cause but this man caused more controversy in the past 2,000 years than any figure in history he's been dead for 2,000 years and he is still a problem in our universities classrooms today why can't we get rid of this man why can't we just get him out of our economy out of our politics out of our social life get rid of Jesus that seemed to be the desire but the reality is difficult the first controversy that has caused problems is the birth of Jesus they hate the fact that he was born supernaturally secondly the life of Jesus is a controversy his miracles the way he responded to pressure the way he handled criticism the way he forgave the unforgivable the way he dealt with people who deserve no mercy his life got people and still make them angry the third controversy is his message what he preached didn't make any sense he taught love and not war he didn't attack the Roman Empire and yet he promised that he would destroy them his disciples used a sword he told them to put it up his message was a message of a kingdom and yet it did not want to take over nations physically as a strange message then his death was a problem and that's the big one we deal with today critical to you and I want you to write this topic down if you want to take a few notes I do want to advise you to take notes today for the next few minutes because you will want to remember especially the young people here today the important facts and truth about your life and about the life of Jesus we want to speak on the subject the birth and death of death today we want to understand the reason why Jesus had to die why he had to die I think every day somebody dies 
And every day there's a funeral somewhere. And some of you have experienced the pain of death from a family loved one. But why did he die? There are seven great controversies in history. I want to name the seven greatest controversies. These caused the most problems in the world. I picked up the US News and World Report magazine yesterday. I picked up the Time magazine this week, day before yesterday, in Charlotte, North Carolina, as I was flying through. I picked up a copy of Newsweek. And I found out that on the cover of all the top US magazines that carry news, they had a picture of Jesus. And it seemed as if even though they may hate him and don't want him in the courtroom or don't want him in the schools or they don't want him in the judiciary, don't want him in government, somehow they can't ignore this inanimous figure, this historic problem called Jesus. The skeptics, they hate him. The Gnostics, they say that he wasn't real. He was some apparition. They have the atheists who say he was just a good man, not really anything important. And there are those who say that he died as a martyr for a cause. But this man caused more controversy in the past 2,000 years than any figure in history. He's been dead for 2,000 years and he is still a problem in our university's classrooms today. Why can't we get rid of this man? Why can't we just get him out of our economy, out of our politics, out of our social life? Get rid of Jesus. That seemed to be the desire, but the reality is difficult. The first controversy that has caused problems is the birth of Jesus. They hate Jesus the fact that he was born supernaturally. Secondly, the life of Jesus is a controversy. His miracles, the way he responded to pressure, the way he handled criticism, the way he forgave the unforgivable, the way he dealt with people who deserve no mercy. His life got people and still make them angry. The third controversy is his message. What he preached didn't make any sense. He taught love and not war. He didn't attack the Roman Empire and yet he promised that he would destroy them. His disciples used a sword. He told them to put it up. His message was a message of a kingdom and yet it did not want to take over nations physically. It's a strange message. Then his debt was a problem and that's the big one we deal with today. All men have to die and many men were crucified under this, in this way but this man's death has caused more problems than his life because after he died the thing that he gave to the earth grew which was his message his kingdom and then the next controversy is his burial they're still wondering where his grave is they're not sure what happened to his body there's all kinds of arguments and all kinds of discussions and debates about this man matter of fact they can't find his body but yet they're still not sure where he is and then the next controversy is his resurrection. Did he rise from the dead or did they steal his body? Did they hide him? Has anyone seen him? Can a man really rise from the dead after three days of rotting? Is it possible for man to live again after he's been killed and, and commissioned into death and sealed in a tomb? Is it possible? It's a controversy still today. The last controversy is his promise. He promised he's coming back and everybody's wondering if it's true. Some people say it's impossible, so you might as well eat and live and drink and be merry for you might as well have fun today because today you might die, so you might as well have fun. There ain't no coming of Christ. It's a controversy about his promise that he's coming back. These are the greatest controversies in history. But I've come here to talk to you about why he's so controversial. 
I want to talk about what caused him to come. The reason why he had to come and die. First, I want to introduce to you what I call the curse of death. This is the ultimate result of disobedience. It's the rebellion of man against God that caused death. And God calls it sin. Write the word sin down, please. It's a very confusing word to some people. The word sin, when it refers to Jesus, is usually a singular word. It very rarely says, he died for our sins. It usually said in the scripture, he died for our sin. It's a singular word. It's singular in the Greek and Hebrew because he really died for only one sin. And that was the sin of rebellion against the known will of God. The word sin in the Hebrew language is the word rebellion. The word sin in the New Testament Greek is not only rebellion, but it also means to miss the mark. This is what man did. God pronounced the wages or the curse of death upon man. Let's read where death came from. And the Lord God commanded the man, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 18. You may want to underline this in your Bible. It says, and the Lord God commanded the man these words, quote, you are free to eat from every tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for the day when you eat from this tree, you will surely die. Everybody say die. Say it loud. This is the first time in the Bible the word shows up. It's introduced not by Satan, but by God. And this word is an invention of God. God created death. Say that with me. God created death. Say it loud. God created death. I thought death was created by Satan, but that is not so. In this chapter, there is no Satan. There is no devil, no demons, no darkness. But in this chapter, there's God. And God is talking to who? Man. And God says to man, the day you eat, you will surely die. Die is introduced by God. So death is something God created and he introduces it to Adam. However, when God 